Well, we just had a pretty great race, and we have a very tired Tim Haraney who has not slept, I think, till <laughs> since Wednesday night, has not had a full sleep. That's what happens, though, when the races are on the other side of the world. Tim, you've had like a crazy schedule the last four or five days, huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's been busy, Adam. Like, uh, not a lot of sleep mixed in with uh, a lot of the craziness, but uh, it, it's a, it, uh, you know, for people who work night shift, I got to take my hat off to you. Oh, my God. Yes. Because. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. I got, I got it. The last text I got from Tim, and then I think after that he assumed I was in bed was yes. Williams. Fuck. <laughs> 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 and that was at one o five a.m. We're recording this, by the way, at seven p.m. Uh, on Sunday. <laughs> and of course, uh, um, so listen, like there's there's so much to talk about, but I think uh, that is the event we got to start with, and that is Alexander Albon. And Daniel Ricardo, Daniel coming off. People called it a bad qualifying. I don't know how qualifying 11th is bad when you're in a racing bowl. I strongly disagree with that. I do too. Like firmly disagree with with that being, Adam, like a a bad qualifying. Wherein that was it bad? He was like a couple hundredths of a second from punching his ticket into the next round of qualifying. Yeah, no, I think that's like RB should be thrilled about this weekend. And we'll kind of talk about it on balance a little bit later, but he had a good qualifying kind of a tough start. Albon had a quicker, a quicker go and, um, and was, was catching him, uh, catching Daniel Ricardo. That is clipped a back tire. It was it spun them both out. It took half an hour to repair the wall. And frankly, these are just race events that happened Tim. Like they're not, it's, you know, nothing uh, untoward here. I think everybody always races to go like, whose fault is it? I think it's just one of those where you go three wide into a turn. I think Lance Stroll was on the other side of Daniel Ricciardo and that happens. But for Daniel, it's like, oh man, like that, that little bit of confidence that he would have grabbed from, you know, qualifying, it has to be extremely frustrating. Although I think he's going to be great in Beijing. Um, uh, my, my question is, for Williams, how much of a problem does this create? All we have talked about over the last couple of weeks, Tim, is the crash, uh, the lack of extra chassis. They just fixed the chassis up. Albon is in the chassis that didn't need to be fixed, which is formerly Logan Sargent's chassis, and he spun it out into the wall. What does that mean for China? Yeah, so that chassis is now damaged. Oh, uh, no. So, yeah, so it's... Uh... <laughs> So it got sent back to uh, Grove, so back to the UK base to be repaired again. Um, and, and you know what? The team sounds pretty confident they're going to be able to repair it and, and get it out to China, no problem. I think the big thing is the amount of money that they spent on not only the repairs, Adam, but also like the freight as well. Like freighting is is going to be expensive for them, and that chews into things, that chews into a lot of things for them. So budget cap specifically, yeah, that too. And then, but there's there's so much. Since there was so much crash damage for them this weekend, the issue with all of it is it really backs up your production of new parts, uh, new components to cover crash damage. Uh, This third chassis that they are trying to get ready and get into the system for Miami. And then also on top of all of that, you're trying to upgrade the car. And so you're having to balance this juggling act and then for a team that doesn't have the infrastructure infrastructure to support all of it, a lot of things I think are just going to end up falling by the wayside. And, you know, it, I think it could put a, a damper on, on upgrades. Like we could get to a race and Williams could have, you know, a major upgrade come and only one of the drivers gets it. Mm-hmm. And that that's happened to Williams before in the past. Yeah, with when, George Russell and Nicholas Latifi, right? Exactly, where it, it ended up being the same with uh, Alex and Nicholas, where it was not enough infrastructure to get parts ready. So Nicholas ended up sticking with old components. Alex got all the new components, and then Nicholas went out and qualified him anyways. But anyway, regardless, a long time ago. But um, that being said, it really just throws a whole wrench into your, your upgrade schedule. And as for like the start of the race, Adam, I mean, Daniel Ricardo got screwed because he started on a harder tire compound than those behind him. Yes. Like everybody who was coming for him from behind were all like most of them are on soft tire compound. So I think for him, it was like the mindset was just, just survive lap one. 
without getting passed by everybody. Yeah. It's like, just survive, get the tire into a window. So it's competitive. And then just, just hold on, just hold on. That's all you got to do is hold on for a few laps while everything gets strung out and we're good. And then, yeah, yeah. just unfortunately was he, he's caught. I think Ant Davidson did a good job of breaking it down on, on sky sports. Essentially he's just looking, he's looking into the mirror where Lance is. And I think Alex is thinking like, Hey, I can go around the outside here. And then Alex is like, Oh, Oh, this isn't going to work. Cause Dana's yep. coming over and he doesn't know I'm here. And, and so that's, that's just a racing incident, unfortunately, but Dan yeah. Ricardo's getting a new chassis himself, Adam. He's getting one in, in China. They're oh, okay. That one too. So, so that go. is, that is official then. Yep. Okay. Well, so, you know, th the fact that he did it with the old chassis at in 11th place, I thought was a positive step for racing bulls. And I think, you know, we'll go, well, since we're talking about them now, I think that this was an extremely positive weekend for them. Yuki Sonoda has been spectacular. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, when you compare racing bulls and I'm going to call them racing bulls cause I can't call them yeah. Yeah, yeah. um, when you compare them with, um, Williams, Williams was the team that you and I sort of had pegged as a team to take a real step forward, finish sixth or seventh, hopefully. And that would be an enormous step for them. Um, even, even though they finished kind of right around that spot last year, the further up the grid you go, the harder it becomes to move forward. They are now, I would say. Uh, fighting for their life to 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 project that over the next 10 races because of the lack of the extra chassis, because of some unfortunate incidents. Logan Sargent gave them a heart attack in FP1. And then, of course, Alex Albon during the race. And now we know that that chassis has got to be replaced. And where does that put them for upgrades? Meanwhile, Racing Bulls, who had objectively the worst car on the grid last year, they finished last. They were a bad team. It was bad. Um, they are looking like the team that should lead the midfield. Or at least, you know, whatever version of the midfield starts from six under. Because I feel like in, in the past, we've had top three teams, middle four teams, yep. bottom four teams. Yep. This year, it feels like five and five. You got top, you got bottom. Yep. And, um, and I'm looking at that Racing Bowl team and the way Yuki's raced, the way Daniel Ricciardo um, qualified, and I'm thinking – boy, that's going to be difficult. And the other team, obviously, that's in there with them is Haas. Yeah. Uh, so, anyway, it, you know, long story short, looking at Yuki Tsunoda's weekend, first time ever scoring points in front of the home crowds in Japan, he had a great race. Yeah, he had an awesome race. He was great, right? I mean, I think uh, I think for, for Yuki, and you and I talked about it on the last show, it was just essentially being able to absorb all the pressure. And yes, but that comes with the home race and there is a ton of it because he's the only Japanese driver on the grid. So all of the attention is going to be on him, all the media attention, fan attention, everything, right? There's not another uh, Japanese driver on the grid that can help, you know, alleviate some of that pressure where it's like, you know, media can go in and cover that angle instead of covering the other angle. And so there's that, but then on top of all that, there's internal pressure that he's putting on himself and I always look at drivers when they go to their home race, because it's like, that's some of the most pressure outside of fighting for a world championship that you're going to face. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, once you're able to deal with that, then, you know, you've really got something on your hands here. And Yuki, like, man, he drove a hell of a race. And there were points where I wasn't too sure who was going to get that 10th, that 10th place, mm -hmm. because, you know, you had Hulkenberg, you had Lance and you had Yuki all fighting for that. And at one point there was more at one point there was like Bottas was in there. Bottas Sarge who's had, who had a good weekend. Yep. Sergeant was in there. So like you had quite a few drivers who, who were at one point fighting for that, that final point uh, paying position. He did great. Uh, flawless, man. I, I thought he was incredible. Yeah, I, I agree. And you know what, Tim, I, I, I what I like about it is, he seems to be far more calm, cool, and collected than he has been in previous years, and that's maturity. Um, but he also seems very comfortable with the car. You don't hear a lot out of Yuki now. It's just, I'm going, and I'm racing, and that's it. And, you know, when you when you talk about the difference between um, his car and the top five cars, it's a huge difference. It really is. Yeah, like, I know we're talking great. tenths of a second, but it's huge. Yeah, and that's, that, that's big, yep. Yep. And and so so you know it's interesting because you look at the top the top 10 and it's always basically the same five teams, right? Now today 
Lance Stroll made a charge for him for 10th place and almost got him, right? Like it was looking looking like he was going to shave a couple seconds off every lap. I don't think the tires lasted long enough. Um, but uh, what is it with Lance's car this weekend that was different? Because obviously, like Daniel Ricciardo, which again, I'm like, why are people so, so hard on this guy? Like that was an incredible qualifying, really great improvement. Lance is another guy where I go, okay, I think there's more context to this situation that people realize and I know we're Canadians, and I know Lance is Canadian. I know anybody watching this is going to be like, "Wow, it's just Canadian bias." What is it, Tim? What <laughs> he did, you know, you know us and our Canadian bias. Uh, uh, what what was it about Lance's car that was so different from Fernando Alonso's? Because their setup were different uh, this weekend, correct? Yeah, they were. I mean, you remember how like you and I were talking about the upgrade that they had brought or they were going to be bringing, and then they unleashed this big upgrade, probably the biggest upgrade on the, on the grid. And Lance was the first one to, to get his hands on that. And that was a decision by the team um, to do that, to, to do the arrow rake testing on his car before they gave it over to Fernando to allow him to go out and, and do what he does. Um, but for Lance, yeah, getting that in FP one, having to do the aero rake testing in FP one, um, you don't, doesn't really give you a ton of time for setup and understanding what that particular car needs. And so for, for the team, I think for, um, trying to figure out which way they wanted to go in, in terms of setup and direction, both cars had the, had the big upgrade, but they ended up switching out Lance's rear wing, rear wing with a different rear wing that ended up costing them quite a bit of time, um, not only on the straights and straight line speed, but it ended up affecting a bit in cornering and grip and, and that sort of thing. And I think for for Fernando, it was all about the direction that he wanted to go in, which was basically feel. Like, how's the mm -hmm. car feel? And let's push in that direction. And then for for Lance, I think his side of the garage maybe wanted to go in the direction of what does the data of our testing and simulation say and we'll go in that direction for, for, for that setup. And I don't think it really didn't pay off for, for Lance, obviously. Um, but I mean, for Fernando, he was, he had the PlayStation set the God mode, man. <laughs> <'Cause>, like, <laughs> he sure did. Well, and, and I think Fernando, uh, is a really great example of how to manage tires and degradation was a major factor. Like if you're a, like a passive formula one fan, you watch every three, four races or something like that. Today, you would have really seen, I think, in a, in such an obvious way, the role tires have to play. And that's because the track was so hot to begin and then cooled throughout the race when the wind picked up. Yeah. But Tim, it, it seems like there's a couple of things going on here. So I'm going to set this up and then I want you to kind of walk us through. Obviously, the Red Bull car seems to be pretty much good at everything, right? Yeah. Uh, difficult to, to point out a flaw. Ferrari is, I think, a lot closer than people give it credit for. And... They're, they seem to have got their tire degradation under control. If oh, yeah. there's anything about the McLaren car, which is squarely the third fastest car on the grid, but feels like sometimes it can catch Ferraris. Um, and, you know, they finished ahead of Ferrari before this, uh, you know, in other races this year. Um, it seems like tire degradation is a real factor on that car. And, you know, Charles Leclerc did a, a, a very good job managing his tires. Um, and was a really good team player today too, letting Carlos by without any fuss. Um, you saw Fernando Alonso manage his tires like only somebody with 20 years of experience in Formula One can. Uh, what is it with A, Fernando's technique, and B, McLaren's car, um, comparing and contrasting? Fernando's really good at, ma is, it, is it Oscar and Lando being young guys, or is this a car issue and they're going to have to fix it? I think like well, well, one of the things. So I'll backtrack a bit for with Lance when so towards the end of the race they slapped on the soft tire compound, uh, and it was basically like a hail mary, like let's try and and score this last point if we sure. can. And they're like they brought him in, and I think it was he did a quite a few stops because of all of that, and then brought him in, slapped on the soft tire, and he got as far as he could, and then the tire just kind of gave up. And that's because you know the surface at this track is very abrasive. Right. We take a look, and we talked a lot about that at Bahrain. It's an abrasive track surface. Now, when it comes down to um, the Aston Martin, the McLaren, so originally Aston Martin was actually struggling a lot with tire uh, degradation at the beginning of the season in the races. They really, really struggled with that. Um, and then for McLaren, 
they they weren't as bad on tire deg as we originally thought that they were going to be mm -hmm. their weakness is slow speed corners where with the aston martin aston martin has a great drs effect it's really strong in 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 high speed stuff now uh it's not as draggy as it as it once was like last year so it's a little quicker in a straight line when the setup is just perfect and then when we talk about the the tire degradation itself some of that comes down to actual uh driving as well like how mm -hmm. does a driver manage tire degradation how do they actually manage uh the tire itself and there's a couple of factors that go into that one of them is how does the driver bring the tire into the right optimal temperature so where it operates the best and that's just a, it's almost like when you get to the hard the hard tire compound it's almost like it's a slow build you know it's a slow build it's a slow build and then the tire starts coming to life it comes to life a few laps later still coming so and then eventually you have performance that gets that gets unlocked from the hard tire with the soft tire it's like performance immediately it warms up really fast uh it provides you with instant grip and it's the highest performing tire on the grid mm -hmm. but the hard tire you can reach close to those levels it takes a long time though to do it mm -hmm. and then it's and then it's performance window it lengthens right it's not like a huge huge peak and then just drops off it, it, it lengthens and it eventually dies mm -hmm. so if you look at when uh let's see here was i think it was lando and oscar when they both swapped, swapped, swapped over to the hards it took them a while for the car to come to life the tire mm -hmm. to come to life and come into the window but then when it did they were very competitive right for fernando towards the end of the race that's that's him that's just that's tire management that's him taking care of everything and then and pulling just, oscar towing oscar in yeah but just keeping oscar at bay mm -hmm. right like just because oscar him, was a half second behind him for what five six laps easily and oscar just couldn't close close the gap like he just couldn't get in and fernando's tires were toast like those things were like forget about it it's even amazing. andrea stella even andrea stella said like afterwards fernando's incredible like <laughs> he's just a great nothing, driver like he's worked with him before in the past but like he knows what alonzo can do and he's just like this that's just fernando alonzo isn't that's all it is to it this is and for oscar it's more you gotta it just takes more experience he just needs more experience with the tire to to just to figure out those last key little tiny details and then you know, eventually he's gonna get it but that takes years i mean that's why Alonzo's Alonzo, right? Like, one of the things I always say with Fernando Adam is like, he he left Formula One, mm -hmm. and he went out and he drove a bunch of different stuff, and that is just so so important for a driver. I think is always driving different things, because when you get in a situation when a Formula car changes, mm -hmm. you have to change with it. And if you're stuck in the same way of doing something and you're forcing the car to, to do something that it just doesn't want to do, then you have to figure out a way to work with it. Mm -hmm. That's what he does. He's able to extract the performance. He's able to get to the performance and the peak levels of the performance of the car super quickly, like super fast at him. He is on it. Like even with new upgrades where the car is like, okay, this is kind of a, a different car right now. Yeah. Like, yeah. He'll push to get to that limit right away, man. And that's what makes him just, just like such a incredible talent. Is, is it fair to say that Fernando Alonso is probably the most tenacious driver in formula one history? Like, yeah, for sure. in, and, and what I mean by that is, is like tenacity, the ability to react despite what's thrown at you and still become out, you know, successful. And he hasn't had, a championship winning car for 15 years. Like it's, it's been a long yeah. time. And, yeah. and so, I mean, yeah, I guess there was a couple of years of Ferrari could have maybe, but he is a, he's a, you're right. He's masterful at some of that stuff. And you know, not every, not every driver is good enough to leave formula one and go, okay, I'm coming back now. Like it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> but what you notice about Fernando is that even when he's on vacation, he's driving. Yep. So always never stops. He, he doesn't stop driving at him. Ever. doesn't stop that, that's one of the things like so when i coach drivers 
like that's one of the that's one of the main things that I'm always making sure that you now you know however far my journey goes with them it's it's you know what else are you driving and always make sure you're driving something different and that's something that I learned mm -hmm. from when I was in Formula Renault and I was instructing um at a racing school and then I was also instructing in like road cars different formula cars uh on different types of tracks, different types of surfaces with different types of cars, were they, you know, road cars, race cars, whatever it was, I was always in something different, doing something different, right seat driving, like mm -hmm. whatever it was, feeling something different to try and feel where you can get the most out of that car. So then when it came time to get into the real race car, and this is something I didn't even know that I was doing until I had done it was the fact that like, oh, the car's doing this. I think a if I do this, yeah, I can get a, I can get it better here and the car will feel better here and I can get a better shot here. And that, that, that just naturally started to happen because of what I was doing before. And that's just something that some drivers like in the lower categories or younger drivers just don't necessarily, they don't do. Mm -hmm. And like, well, and they're so, so focused important. on it's, it's, um, it's like, uh, when they talk about, um, uh, any other professional athlete, they say, you got to play other sports. Yeah. You know, like you got to develop other muscles and other ways of doing things. Otherwise, if you just focus on one sport, you're probably not going to maximize your own potential. Right. Well, you're going to get in a situation where you're just going to be like totally screwed. And you're like, how do I, how do I figure this out? I right. can't bring the setup. I can't bring the car set up to me and I can't go to it. What are we doing? Like, right. you know, so it's like, it's, I always, I always uh, was really big on that. I still am. Um, but yeah, it like Fernando, I, I feel like he is that driver where it's, mm -hmm. I've always, I've said it on this podcast where like he could make anything fast. Like it yep. doesn't matter what it is. Yep. He'll get in it and he'll, he'll get to the limit of the car quickly, like on it immediately. And you saw that this weekend with him and like brand new set of upgrades. And he's like, no, no, I want to, you know, let's go this way. Boom, boom, boom. We're gone. And then just. Holding on for dear life towards the end of this race. Like, yes, and pulling in Oscar, and then uh, George Russell eventually got by Oscar Piastri. It was actually a good piece of driving by George Russell to even grab a few extra points at the end of the race. He is out qualifying Lewis Hamilton. He is out racing Lewis Hamilton, and Lewis Hamilton, for his part, let him by. Um, there are going to be questions, and I it, it seems like an odd thing to ask of Lewis Hamilton. I know that there was the the reporter that said, "Are you jealous of the Ferrari drives?" And he's like, "Can you ask me some better questions, please?" But um, not been a great start to Lewis's time his last year at Mercedes. He's already called it his worst. Uh, what do you think is going on between the two of them? Why is George able to extract the most out of a very mediocre car, and Lewis doesn't seem to be able to match that? Yeah, it was an interesting weekend for Mercedes, eh, Adam? Like yeah. it was yeah. it was up and it was up and down for them. Like you even at one point, I think Lewis said, uh, I believe it was Saturday after qualifying, Lewis was even saying, like, hey, this is uh this is one of the best cars I've driven in this regulation, like this twenty twenty two since the twenty twenty two regulation. Like, and that's saying like, something. Oh, that's saying a lot, right? So it's like and then all of a sudden, you know, you get the race day and it's like, oh geez, like what happened here, right? Like, oh my god. So I <laughs> I think for I think for the difference between, you know, Lewis and George in particular in this race is just simply the strategy. Like they just, they just decide like Mercedes trying to do a one stopper with Lewis, try to run him as long as he can on the hard tire. And it just didn't work out. Like the, the amount of degradation that we've been talking about, like the amount of degradation that they were suffering from, like just, it, it wasn't possible for them in that car. But I think like one of the, one of the things that like people are missing here is like, I think like Mercedes like cut their deficit to to Red Bull in half, like from last year. So if you yeah, go back six, I, go I back don't think we knew. Months, I don't think most people know that. Yeah, go back six months. Like go back to Japan last year because this is a great track for us to get a barometer on where everybody is. Mm -hmm. like you go back then and you take a look and you see what the deficit was from Mercedes to from Mercedes to Red Bull, mm -hmm. and then you come to this and you see where they were. Like there were glimpses where they were able to kind of get everything sort of dialed in and man they were only like five tenths like four tenths sometimes like i think that's a lot of teams had that this weekend and mm -hmm. that's one of the things that we we're not really talking about that we should be is the amount that teams have closed the gap to red bull and how 
important that is to focus on because that tells us that like teams are catching up. Yeah. Yeah. So which is and and that is that's a major takeaway. Like like huge. Toto Toto said <laughs> no one's shame. catching Max this this year. Um I don't and then agree Max with that. I don't agree with that, Adam. So I and, and I want to get into that. Yeah. Max also with a very funny reply is saying, Well, he, Toto's been saying a lot of nice things about yeah. me this year. Uh we know what Toto wants. And sure, yes. yeah, um funny that they used to be like mortal enemies, and it's so funny how wins <laughs> change in Formula One. But Tim, talk about Ferrari's comments because what's less it's you don't learn anything from from winning the way Red Bull does in terms of like if you're watching the sport, you're not Red Bull is dominating. It's fantastic. And Adrian Newey's built an incredible car and they've got an incredible driver and the whole organization is great. This is not me taking away from them. But somebody is going to catch Red Bull eventually. It's going to happen. I think people believe because we've had one, two finishes most of the year with the exception of uh, Australia um, that, that it's not going to happen this year. Where does Ferrari see themselves? Yeah, that's, I mean, for Ferrari, they see themselves as being able to put pressure on on Red Bull Racing. They feel that they can challenge for a Constructors' Championship this year. And you know what, Adam? I tend to agree with them. Why do you agree with them? Because that's a bold statement, Tim. Man, like, look at, uh, look at Australia. If, if, even if Verstappen didn't have the, the brake caliper, brake failure, mm-hmm. like, I, Carlos Sainz still would have won that race. Like you think they so? were, yeah, they were the faster team. Every like McLaren even said that they probably would have like Carlos would have won anyways. Even Sergio Perez said that Ferrari probably would have won anyways. So that tells us that the Ferrari is going to be strong at certain race tracks, mm-hmm. and they still haven't brought a big upgrade. Okay, so we don't know what that looks like, and we don't know how much performance they can get from that. I mean, I'm thinking. New upgrade. They're maybe about three to four tenths in the race right now. They're off of Red Bull, but they do really well with managing the tire. You bring an upgrade, maybe it gives you like two tenths. That's right there changes the game, man. That's yeah. like we're talking now. We're talking Ferraris fighting for P2, putting pressure on either Max or Sergio, whoever is in P1 at that moment for race victories. And that's all you got to do. And Leclerc even said it, and he's right, and I agree with him. You just got to put pressure. You put some pressure on them. And I think, like, once you start putting pressure, that's when people start to really, you know, make mistakes. Max has been flawless. Flawless, Adam. And I think you just put him under a little bit of pressure, and you just see what happens. Like, we don't know. He's probably going to still maintain being incredible. Let's not forget that. But, I mean, I still think, and I agree with Ferrari, that, yeah, I think they eventually they're going to be able to start putting even more pressure on Red Bull for wins. Like I, the season isn't the, the drivers' championship. And I think you know we did say this at the beginning of the season. That's probably Max's. Mm-hmm. Okay, probably is Max's for sure. But the constructors is where I'm just. I don't think so, man. You just don't. You're not. You're not confer, or You're not convinced yet. Not yet. I well, still think like the, like. Mercedes, okay, forget it. Like mm-hmm. Total Wolf saying, like no one's going to catch Max, and maybe you're not going to catch Max. Yeah, but like in, in Red Bull, but I think Ferrari still has that. Ferrari still has that chance. They aren't that far off. Uh, for Ferrari, like in qualifying, they go a couple different ways on some setup changes. They're probably sniffing pole position. Uh, again, all you need is some clean air with these cars. Now you get some clean air and you're good to go. That's it, I man. Think... You get the Monaco. Like, let's talk about Monaco. You get the Monaco. Ferrari out qualifies Verstappen. They're not beating them. No, you go to the no, tracks well... where it's hard to pass. You out qualify yeah. Max Verstappen. He's not. He's not passing. No and way. also, Char- Charles Leclerc needs to win a, f- a flipping race in Monaco. Like <laughs> the way <laughs> the luck that he has had in yeah, qualifying. Like you know, remember he, a couple years ago, he like qualified first, put it in the wall, couldn't race. Like it's just you know, he first off, Charles got to win that race this year. Secondly, Tim, I think the problem and, and why it's so hard to believe as a fan is because the only time Max has been beaten in the last really you know season and a half um, is Singapore. Like where it was a real race because Australia was a um, a retirement, you know, his his, yeah. his brakes caught on fire. So we always sort of think, oh, Max is gonna Max is gonna do this. But one thing I do want to throw out there is 
A, Ferrari looks really, really good. B, in the races that he's been in, and remember, he had appendicitis and had to have his appendix removed. Um, Carlos Sainz has been on the podium every single time. He's every single awesome. time. It's been awesome, man. Like, I'm the, listen, I'm always pounding that Carlos Sainz drum. You know that, baby. I'm you just are. Like, you Carlos are. You've Sainz. always said that. It's Carlos Sainz. He's going to outwork you. That's what he's going to do. That's what he did. I mean, qualifying, still not the not where it should be for him. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, you know, obviously that's a, when you're comparing him to Charles Leclerc, who I think is the best qualifier on the grid, you know, hands down when it comes to the racing though. I mean, Carlos is incredible. He's an incredible racing driver. He's just, he's really at that peak now where he just knows everything he needs to do within a race to get to where he needs to go for Japan. Like, I don't think he really believed in that final stint that he was going to be able to to get that to 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 get that podium position. Right. Charles Leclerc had driven a hell of a race, man. Like trying to do his strategy, which was I believe he was running like trying to do a one stopper as well at one point. Yeah. Uh, and he made he eked out the medium tire for forever. I don't know how Leclerc was able to keep that medium tire alive as long as he did. Mm hmm. And I think for for Carlos, I just think he was just like, there's no way I'm going to be able to to catch that. But the the amount of the offset between how new the tire was, what his teammate was running, the drivers that were in front of him as well, the tire offset in the deg was just so high that he was just able to be like, OK, yeah, OK, I'm going to I'm going to track I'm going to track down my teammate here and I'm going to take that podium away from him and no one's going to stop me. Because if Ferrari were to radio him like, hey, like, don't pass your teammate, he's going to be like, yeah, I'm passing him. And, I'm passing him. and Char Charles, Charles let him do it, too. Charles was like, yeah, no, he's got it. <laughs> it's going to happen. 100%. I think they're 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 good teammates. Leclerc really supports Carlos every time he's asked. He always speaks very highly of him at the same time whenever whenever we talk to him about Carlos. And I, I just think like. He's going to be missed at that team, and he's having a hell of a season, man. He's oh. he's he's doing one of Adam. He's doing one of those. You're going to let me go? All right, yeah. I'm going to show you. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Now, um, it was interesting, and I, I want every time we talk about Carlos until we know where he's going, uh, especially when he's performing like this, we're going to talk about where he's going. Uh, like it's going to happen. Um, Sergio Perez today said he should know in the next month whether he'll be in that Red Bull seat. Mm. Do you know anything? about Carlos and Red Bull. Nothing nothing on that on that front. I, hmm. I still don't think that that is the the right fit for him. I think the question is is basically like how many we all know like Carlos wants a long-term stability. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it all depends on what Total Wolf wants to do. Like does he mm -hmm. want to give out long-term stability? Does he want to give out more than two years because i think the fear you know i think the fear with with that may be what happens with kimmy antonelli what if he mm -hmm. turns out to be really great and we have a situation where we're getting you know piastried where like you bring this guy up give him everything he needs make sure he does well you see that like he's really starting to grow and develop and evolve and then all of a sudden another team swoops in and is like hey we'll give you a seat right now if you just leave that Mercedes program, it can happen. That stuff does happen. And I think for, for Toto, that may be a bit of a fear, right? Because like well, Verstappen was a driver that he wanted for yes. a long, for, for quite a while, like before Max got to F1, like that was a driver like Toto Wolf really coveted to try and, to try and get, but he couldn't give him a seat. Like he couldn't give him a Mercedes seat at the time. Right. Now, I know Williams doesn't want to be treated like the junior Mercedes program, but I'm sure they could benefit from a Kimi Antonelli and Alex Albon pairing. By the way, Logan Sargent had a good race until the spin-out. He did. I want yeah, to say. Yeah, he did. It was really, but really good. The thing with Williams, though, Adam, is is like they've got their driver development plan. I don't know if James Valls is willing to to shift on that anymore. Like, they're already buying the engines. They're, they're paying for the rear ends on their car for Mercedes. And it's like, we're not we're not your junior junior team. Like we're not doing that. And I, th I think that's where James is to be honest with you. I, I really don't think that they could take Kimi Antonelli and throw him in that car. I just, it defeats the purpose of having a young driver program. Right. Well, yeah. And exactly. And why would any young talented, extremely talented driver sign up for the Williams young driver program? 
yeah. watching watching all their young drivers get superseded by Mercedes's yeah. guy. Hundred percent, perfect. That you just said it. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You know what? It's interesting with that Mercedes second seat. Like, obviously, you want you know if you're if you're Toto and you get Max Verstappen, you probably don't care. Like, well, the chips fall where they may with with Kimi Antonelli. But um, I'm curious about uh, what they do if they don't get Max, which is pretty likely that they're not going to get Max yeah. at least this year. You know, if you know, we 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 don't think Carlos is a great fit. We know that Carlos has been linked to Audi. We know that he's been, you know, there have been discussions with Mercedes. I'm sure everybody, every team on the grid with an open spot would take Carlos signs at this point. And I think the grid's going to hold until he signs. It's one of those where he's the linchpin. And as soon as you pull that linchpin, then everybody's going to sign up and go their ways. Um, who is a good fit for Mercedes like next year? It could be a one-year deal. Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's the thing. I mean, who are you going to convince to come on board who's on the grid right now for a one-year deal in a car that's, that may not be that competitive, right? Like it may be okay. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling it's probably going to be where Ferrari is this year. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that's probably going to be Mercedes next year where Ferrari is this year, but then Ferrari obviously evolves and challenge Red Bull for, for not only constructors, but drivers. Mm -hmm. and, then, and it seems like 2026 is the next real time that Mercedes is going to be that competitive, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, that's, that's the major shift that you hope, uh, you know, brings teams back to, to, to ground level and you all start from zero again. And I think that's what they're, they're hoping for, because I think they know that it's going to take a couple of years to get back to trying to challenge for a, a drivers and a world driver, a world um, a constructors championship. So say, like, well, who would on the grid would be interested in taking a one year deal? I mean, like I, if I'm Alex Alvin, there's no way. I'm not no. going back to doing that. I already did it at Red Bull. Like, forget it. And if he's I'm got the like, team that's built around him. Yeah, and if I'm Esteban Ocon, I'm the same same thing, man. I'm like, yeah, I mean, Alpine may suck right now, but like, who's to say that in a year and a half or two years, they're not that bad? So why would I take a one-year deal to come down to you guys when I can maybe get a three-year plus an option up here, like back at Alpine? It, like, so it doesn't make sense. It sounds weird, and I don't think he would do it, but if things don't work out well for, like if Ricardo puts in good performances and they retain Checo Perez, do they keep, does he stay at, at Racing Bull or does he do what he's always wanted to do? And he's apparently always wanted to be a Ferrari driver and always wanted to be a Mercedes driver. Man, I don't know. That's a good question. But, you know, but then he's got to perform, right, Adam? Like well, he's he got to perform. He can't keep getting beat by, by Yuki. Like he's no. got to be beating Sonoda. Well, and is Yuki a guy that would, you know? Well, he's got, that, he's got the, the Honda deal. So right. for... He he does have uh, backing from Honda, so I don't. I don't. It feels like Aston. It might be a good fit in the future there. Well, I, I think that's that could be like if if Yuki's able to hang around in Formula One long enough, I think that would that would try. They would probably try and get him over there for sure. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't see why not. I mean, if you're you're sponsoring the guy, like you'd probably want to try and retain him and hold on to him as long as you can. And if good you can for move Aston him to Martin. Team, yeah. Well, yeah, for sure. It'd be good for sure. Yeah. I I think like like. It, the driver market is just so uh it's just so wide open at the moment it's it's interesting i mean mm -hmm. you had the mirror i think it was the mirror they were reporting like carlos Sainz going to going to sauber uh for an audi deal and he had like an ultimatum on like when he needed to sign and i think like i think for carlos it, it's it's he probably wants to go to Mercedes. I think Total Wolf doesn't want to give him something that's long, long term. Mm -hmm. And then I think at the end of the day, Carlos may have to go somewhere where he's going to get that long term deal, even if that means sacrificing, you know, competitive car. Um, I, that's what I think, anyways. The way, well, the way it looks. So. I, I almost think like if Kimi Antonelli can put together, and I'll, I'll be honest, I haven't paid attention to F two in a couple weeks. But if Kimi Antonelli can put together a good season, if you're going to be non-competitive, all the reports, by the way, are that Mercedes has the best engine right now for 2026. That's the reports. <laughs> now, I don't know how you verify that, yeah, but just... those are the reports. The reports are Red Bull's, <laughs> the Red Bull Ford thing isn't going well, right? And that, and that Ferrari is going to be co really competitive and that Mercedes, the, the leak set of the factor is that this is a crazy engine. It's going to be amazing. That's what's... Yeah, I, I don't I don't know where you're getting that info from, right? Well, like, it's it's not great info, let's be I, honest. But I just but want like, you to know like, that the rumors are out there. How 
can they actually quantify without being on the track and being competitive against each other? That's a good question. <laughs> they even know like who's going to be good or, or not. Like that's whatever. Yeah. Well, so, uh, but you know, these are media reports that are out there. Right. And yeah. of course, listen, Tim, I, the reason that you are the expert and I am not, is that I bring up the salacious news reports and you bat them down. <laughs> okay. That's the, that's the whole dynamic here. I'm the fan that's reading all the, all the crap. And you're like, that's crap. That's total crap. Okay. That's okay. That's all right. Like that, that's, See, this is what this is what we got to do here. So, um, if, <laughs> if, we have to do this. Right we now. have to. We, we have must. To do. Um, and that's part of the joy of Formula One is all the salacious news reports. But I, yeah, I for sure, I, if if I'm Total Wolf, one of the things you have to be considering, you must consider this, is that if you do believe you're going to be extremely competitive in 2026, which is why I brought this up in the first place, um, if Kimi Antonelli can put together a good season in F2, and 2025 you're going to be mildly competitive, you're going to be fourth or fifth again or whatever, why not bring him in, give him a season under his belt, let George rule the roost as he should, and see what you have. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that's a good idea. He's going to have a, um, <clears throat> he's going to have a test in uh, one of Mercedes's older cars in a few weeks. And I think that's going to be just to evaluate, like, what do they have here before mm -hmm. putting him into, I think Total Wolf had said, like, before putting him into, like, uh, the w uh what was it the w14 yes it's like he was Yikes. like yeah we're gonna put him in a good car first before we put him in a bad, in a bad car <laughs> yeah <laughs> i like that he's so, got a sense of humor about it oh yeah, yeah i mean he's he's pretty good about it but uh it, it's smart to do that i mean they can evaluate him a little bit more they can see what they've what they've got um i just don't i just don't know if he's gonna be right i mean i haven't been like i've been watching formula two I've been watching what he's he's been doing. I mean, it's been okay. It's not like earth, you know, it's not like earth shattering, but like I feel at this moment he still needs another year in Formula 2, and I don't know if I would take him out of there like just just like too early. Well, you but he should win. He should win before they take him out of there. Yeah, I think like Yeah, I just don't I wouldn't I just wouldn't do it. I, not not yet anyways maybe let's see what happens in two months and then we can make that this then you know we can we, we can make our own decisions at that point yeah here's, even though they here's, mean here's, absolutely nothing <laughs> <laughs> here's throwing a wrench in it uh you've always or you've said to me behind the scenes before and and correct me if i'm wrong here but i believe you thought staff and van dorn got screwed stoffel stoffel yeah, van yeah. dorn excuse Stoffel me. van dorn and who is the uh backup driver for uh, aston martin now right uh, is he not the yeah, third driver, like, reserve driver? No, nah, not really. Like he sort of does some stuff with him. I don't know, like his full. It's not the same he, that Nico he was. Had. Like he was doing some things. I think he's still there in some capacity. But Felipe Drogovic is their is their reserve driver now at, at Aston. But um, yeah, is I always Van Dorn, felt like is he is he ever going to be? Uh, I know it's I, been I a long time. No, I don't think so. I think his Formula One days are done. But like I always thought, I always rated him really high. I, I thought he was a he was a really great driver. I remember when he made his debut in the McLaren, mm -hmm. and he was filling in for uh, I believe it was Alonso, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. And he was incredible, man. Like, I think he scored points if I remember correctly. He was in Bahrain. Uh, he, yeah, I, I always rated him pretty high. Uh, I always thought he was a very good talent. Never really got a good shot, and I don't think like he got a good shot when he was with McLaren. Mm -hmm. Just don't. I don't think. Oh, like there was that. a. It was a terrible car. Yeah, was terrible powertrain. It was all. Everything was bad. That was just, it's just terrible. Yeah. So I. I mean, like, yeah. I always. I always rated uh, Stoffel very high. How did we get on to Stoffel Van? Well, Dorn? I brought him up I because I Jack thought, you know what? Like, I'm. I'm. I'm going through my mind. Like, who would take a one year deal at Mercedes? Here's another one. Nico Hulkenberg. Contracts <laughs> up. German yeah, driver. Well, I don't Qualifying know. I think. Well. I, I think like Nico either stays with Haas or he goes to Sauber. Wow, really? That's what I think. Yeah, that's why. Well, think. I, I guess because Audi, right? The the the, yeah, the German sure. connection too. And he's 100%. also been very good. Oh yeah, I I would. That's a, that's what I would do. You got to get you know get that level of experience coming onto your team. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to consider it. Like it's going to help you as a as a new manufacturer coming into Formula One. Like mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. But that that's who I that's where I think that's what I think happens with Nico. He either stays back at Haas. Or he he moves over to to be with that Sauber Audi program. 
um, yeah, for, for Mercedes, I think again, like you've got to look at experience and you've got to look at who's out there at the moment, who's got that experience and, um, who can stay on, on task with George. Mm. you know and it, but but it, yeah i think adam again like it's just going to come down to like what what are the terms how long are you going to give a driver like how, how many years are you going to give them i don't think you're going to get a really great driver in that seat by just giving them a one-year deal and somebody's gonna get it. somebody has got to get nico hulkenberg a podium please god get that <laughs> man a podium <laughs> he deserves well, I mean, it <laughs> well, i mean like adam he had a good race he did like, he's he's been great this year actually yeah. He was good. In, he was good in Japan. Um, I, I I thought like he was going to be. He, he I, th- I thought he was going to get close to to getting that final point in in the race. But yeah, I mean, just just coming up short, obviously. But yeah, I thought I thought he's been excellent. I think he's done really well with Haas. Um, actually, both drivers have been pretty solid. Like even Magnussen had a had a good race. Uh, on Sunday, he was 13th and then Hulkenberg 11th. Um, yeah, I just, I think both of those Haas drivers have been really strong and they drove really well in Japan. Uh, again, we've talked about this, but just comes down to what is that team going to do with the upgrades for their car moving forward? Um, but yeah, I, I think Haas has done really well. Well, Tim, do you have anything else you'd like to hit from the race or would you like to go to bed? Oh no! I mean, I talk about the race all. Day I know long. you can't. I, well, I, I know you I can. Feel, okay, I feel bad for Valtteri Bottas. Oh, I mean, great, great weekend. And listen, Sauber really had better pit stops, did they not? Four seconds instead of forty. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, that's an improvement. But... Yeah, they're they're they were good. I think. Um, I, I just yeah, I just feel so bad for him, man. Like there was. There was a whole cluster of them that came in for a stop towards the end of the race, right? You had, uh, yeah. who was in there? You had Sonoda, Sargent, uh, if I remember correctly, Bottas was in there. Um, and I think, like, obviously with the RB, like, they nailed that pit stop, man. Mm-hmm. Absolutely nailed it for Yuki. And then for Bottas, like, again, he was also in contention for that final point as well. Gets screwed with a, you know, four second pit stop. And uh, I feel bad for the guy. New upgrade yeah. on the car too. New floor for the car. He done well with it. Uh, man, yeah. He's uh, you know what? He's still a really good driver. I yeah, know people sure. aren't paying attention to him, but uh, he's getting the most out of that car. So we've got we got questions in the debrief. Adam. Let's do that. Um, Gabriel Morenci. Oh, hi, Gabriel. Wow. <laughs> I know this is pretty sweet. Yeah, he says he says great job, Tim. I enjoy your work. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate that, and I'm sure Adam does as well. He said I uh, appreciate who... Tim as well. <laughs> yeah, he wants to know who had the fastest pit stop. So the fastest pit stop that went to Red Bull, and I believe it was two point zero one, and that's how fast it was. I believe that's that's what the exact. Uh, timing of it mm-hmm. but yeah that's who yeah red bull 2.08 and then you had perez just behind 2.13 and then lando norris was a 2.31 but was max verstappen red bull racing 2.08 fastest pit stop in the race um at greg scharf how badly could williams woes with crashes affect their development in the short and the long term yeah, I mean, Greg, it is something that Adam and I kind of touched on, but like, essentially, it's just going to throw a huge wrench into this development war that we are starting to see in in Formula One. Mm-hmm. And man, like it it can it it can hurt them badly. I think like you you could have they could have projected, hey, we want some upgrades for Imola, but now because of these crashes, maybe that puts them back a few races because of all the crash damage. Right. Um, at F1 Fiend, how did Charles Leclerc make it on a stop on hard tires and Lewis Hamilton uh, couldn't? I think he means by the the, the one-stopper. I uh, believe Leclerc was running the mediums, if I'm not mistaken, but I think a big part of that is how that Mercedes obviously uses the tire, the tire deg, mm-hmm. and eventually they're going to need another upgrade that's going to help them sort that sort that out. Uh Jay Money, how nice is it 
that the pure dominance of Carlos Sainz has been stopped. It's nice <laughs> to see someone else win for a change. Adam, <laughs> do you want to take that one? I think that's funny. That, that's good, man. <laughs> I, I <laughs> you, you know what? I don't think you can stop uh, what's going on with Carlos Sainz right now. That I, I hope he'll be, if if all things go right, he'll be the first driver in Formula One to get two wins since 2022. Two wins other than Max and and Sergio. And I think that's that's amazing. That's an amazing thing. Um, Tim, when it comes down to it, the first weekend where Red Bull gets soundly defeated, they don't get pull, they don't win the race, okay? Who is the driver at Ferrari that pulls it off? Oh, uh... Mm. Because we know Carlos isn't the best qualifier, but right, eh. I, I'm going to say Charles Leclerc. Just simply, he's going to here's what he's going to do. He's going to get pole, and thankfully, he's got that nice clean air in front of him. He's mm-hmm. going to be able to sail off right off into the sunset. <laughs> no tire dag for him because he's got no dirty air in front of him to to slow him down, and that's what's going to happen. Carlos Sainz is going to maybe finish second or third. Max will probably second or third, one or the other, and that's how it's going down. I love it. I love it. Uh, we got we have one more from Fiona. Can whoever's using Daniel's voodoo doll stop now? <laughs> uh, in all seriousness, do you think we'll see uh, a Lewis Hamilton podium anytime soon? That's actually a good question. I mean, I think Adam for for Lewis, it's it's going to be a difficult year for sure. Yeah, but, but like you, you got to take a look at like what Ferrari's doing because he probably just nailed something here again right mm-hmm. like, yeah he's probably gonna go to ferrari next year and like do some damage like they're gonna they're gonna be good like he could potentially if they're able to keep this development uh rate up yep man i, I could see him and leclerc like pushing verstappen for a, a driver's championship like it's yeah i mean Oh, it's, it's so, uh, like first off, you're so right about the voodoo back. doll. It's ridiculous. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lewis. I don't know. I, it's going to be a great day when he does. Uh, but damn, like Mercedes is just not that competitive, right? It's just not. I, Tim, do you think that they can upgrade it enough? I mean, we saw McLaren do a crazy turnaround last year. Can Mercedes bring the kind of upgrades that you need to get into the top three? Oh, it's going to be hard, man. Just, yeah. just to see where everybody was after Japan. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I don't think Aston Martin is the fourth fastest team. Like, I I do think Aston Martin's probably fifth. I think in, in Mercedes is definitely fourth. And then you've got McLaren, like you like you had said earlier in the show. I just think that that gap between, like, that fourth, fourth fifth to third is mm-hmm. just, it, it's just a tiny bit too much. You really have to nail your development mm-hmm. to, I think, close that gap down and, and, and surpass McLaren. I think that may be hard yeah. because I think like McLaren's really onto something, man. Like I just, once they start getting their issues with um, corner exit uh, and slower speeds corners, like McLaren's going to be. Is that a relatively be... easy problem to fix? All, all things considered, it's hard because, like, once you try to fix something, you create. Sometimes you create a problem somewhere else. I see. Or you you try to fix something, but you take away a bit of what you're good at, like okay. what the cars. And you don't want to do that, right? Yeah. And it's like it's trying to find that balance between mm-hmm. all of it to that really and, makes it makes sense. And let's be honest, we could use a little more McLaren speed on a straightaway. We just could. <laughs> Need a little more of that. Man, McLaren. Oh, yeah. I like, I like McLaren. Uh, do you want to do grid rival? Let's because, do it. Oh, because, uh, man. Did I, took, I have a I rough took, week? <laughs> Just terrible. I Okay, Tim. At one point, I was like 14th. I'm now 61st. <laughs> oh, I, I went to 43 party. last week and 61 this week. Who were your drivers? Oh, man. My team is horrible. I dropped to like 273rd, like 273. Oh, God. Who'd you pick? Oh, dude, I, I haven't swapped my drivers out at all yet. Danny Ricardo, Albon, Piastri, Russell, Stroll, Williams is my team. Uh, and that's who I've had for the last four races. <laughs> that is, see, this is why you got to sign the one year con or the one race contracts, Tim. But I, I, one guy I locked up, obviously right at the beginning was Verstappen. But I think I got Piastri what I thought was on a deal. Uh, I got him for at, like at around 20 million and he's now up at 22 uh for cap space and he's still 
above his five race average. Like he had 131 points. Charles Leclerc, I locked up a couple races ago because he'd had a rough race. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, I got, I'm going to get him while he's low. Yeah. And then the other guy I locked up for five races, I'm like, Lewis Hamilton. How far, how much further is he going to fall? And of course, today, my first race with him, he oh, falls yeah. again. And, and then I had Logan Sargent. That went well. And my, and because I have no money left, Sauber. So it's just, it's just bad. It's just bad, man. <laughs> my thing is, is like, what, May, like what's what's better is it do you want to have a competitive team or do you want to go for the drivers and have a non-competitive team see i i to me that's, oh it's tough it's so I know, tough that's that's what i was thinking too yeah because you the one thing I, I will say is that if you nail that if you nail the driver under 19 million where you can you can star them and double their points like you nailed them that week that makes your entire week and you're looking at the guys if you look at the guys who are at the top, they nail it every single flipping week. <laughs> Sunar is just crushing us all. And yeah. he put Nico Hulkenberg in that spot. Yeah. And Nico had a great race, right? All you have to do is get the guy to finish 12. So he's got a lot of the same drivers I do. Verstappen, Piastri, Hamilton. And he put Magnuson and then has the Red Bull team. Red Bulls. That, see, that's Kill what it. I mean. Killed it. That's what yeah. I think. Like you, you put the right team. That's what I think. You can find that mix of... Of like you get that star driver, but then you get that right team, and that that's where I think it is. Like it's, I mean, we've had a shuffle up in the top five for sure. Noah Blake, fifty eight second, uh, MS eighteen, they dropped to mm-hmm. third, tied for third is the uh, home hominator, <laughs> 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 and then in, uh, in fifth we've got uh, Cyrus, who also he also jumped up, or they also jumped up as well. So yeah. like it's. A lot of big winners this week. And, yeah, and, and you know what's crazy? Sunhire has already got $122 million in cap I know, space. I, saw that too. I hate it. I hate it. Awesome. I just want him to know I hate it. Uh, well, Tim, listen, we're going to let you go. We let you get a good, good night's sleep, my friend. We'll catch up a little later this week and we'll see what drama unfolds between now and Thursday. Sounds good. Thanks, Adam.